Starfleet's known for its massive starships that can house hundreds or even thousands of crew members for years at a time, but there are countless smaller support vessels needed to keep their fleet running. Some are used routinely, while others only popped up once or twice, but they all have their own unique purposes and help to make Star Trek feel more alive and realistic. These auxiliary crafts carry out lots of different jobs including maintenance, construction, transport, luxury sightseeing, combat and much more. We are going to explain the roles of all of these auxiliary support ships used throughout Star Trek. By the end, you'll realise that the fleet is made up of far more than just starships and space stations. The Enterprise, and other ships like it, are the motherships of their own small armadas. I'm Tom Roberts Finn for Trek Culture, and this is Every Auxiliary Craft in Star Trek Explained. Shuttles were the standard auxiliary craft aboard Starfleet ships and space stations. Most had warp nacelles for faster than light travel, and some were even equipped with replicators and transporters. They were used to transport officers to missions away from the mothership, and to land on planets in cases where transporters were not available. We've seen countless shuttle variants throughout Trek, starting with the classic Class F shuttlecraft from the original series. In the animated series, we were introduced to the Copernicus, the unnamed shuttle from Mud's Passion, and the Aqua Shuttle, which was a shuttle capable of floating on water like a boat and submerging under like a submarine. Updated shuttles appeared in the TOS films along with the smaller vessels known as travel pods and shuttle pods, though other shuttle pods were in use as early as the 22nd century aboard the NX-01. In the next generation, the Enterprise-D housed several classes all at once, including the Type 6, the Type 7 shuttles, and Type 15 shuttle pods. Somehow, despite its much smaller hangar, Voyager was shown to have a nearly endless supply of shuttles. The ship was confirmed to hold Type 6 and Type 8 shuttles, and the sleeker, more elongated Class 2. Later, in the next generation films, we got more variants like the Type 11 and the Winged Argo, equipped with its deployable ground vehicle, as well as several new designs from Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, and the films in the alternate timeline. The Protostar also has its own shuttle variant that can be produced by the ship's vehicle replicator. It's likely that all these shuttle variants have their own pros and cons, but all follow the same basic design rules set by the original Class F. Next, we have the Runabouts. Runabouts were introduced as the main support craft assigned to Deep Space Nine, though they also appeared in other Trek shows like the next-gen episode Timescape. Runabouts could be operated by a limited crew and are larger in size than simple shuttles, but smaller than starships. Most were capable of travelling at warp 5, and the large interior space allowed for them to be modified for space cargo or mission needs. Several people could also live aboard the runabouts for days or even weeks at a time. There were onboard replicators, an eating area, sleeping accommodations and a transporter. The Danube class is the most well-known runabout variant. Several were stationed at Deep Space Nine and were used extensively for some of the earliest missions into the Gamma Quadrant. They were even used in the Dominion War, both as fighters and on stealth missions. Later, a new runabout model, the Yellowstone class, was introduced in the Voyager episode Non Sequitur. Now, let me slip into something a little more comfortable. If you look closely at the underside of Enterprise D's saucer section, you can see the outline of Picard's personal captain's yacht, the Calypso. Captain's yachts were relatively large support vessels that could be used by the captain for personal missions away from the starship. The Calypso was never used on screen, but we got to see the Enterprise E's captain's yacht, the Cousteau, in action in Star Trek Insurrection. Captain's yachts were basically just luxury shuttles. It's really no surprise that Picard wasn't too fond of them. He wasn't the kind of captain to just leave his crew to go on his own little cruise. Many other vessels, including the California class, and the Nebula class ships also featured captain's yachts under their saucer, but others had different support vehicles. A schematic seen in the episode Live Fast and Prosper labelled a vehicle called the Aero Shuttle on the underside of Voyager's hull, though it's not clear why the crew never used the vehicle during their stay in the Delta Quadrant. The Nova class from Equinox was also confirmed to have a similar vessel under its saucer called the Wave Rider. For when a vessel needs to be evacuated, all Starfleet ships are equipped with enough escape pods to carry the entire crew. Starfleet escape pods come in many different designs, but are all equipped with only the most minimal requirements to sustain their passengers. Some, like the Kelvin pods from Star Trek Beyond, can only hold one person, while others, like the USS Saratoga's escape pods from the DS9 episode Emissary, could hold about 12. These small, cramped pods weren't designed to be lived in for very long, and prosper. They had subspace transmitters that could be used to send a distress signal and could typically land safely on planetary surfaces, where the occupants could await being rescued. It was never mentioned on screen, but it's worth mentioning that the Star Trek The Next Generation technical menu stated that the Enterprise D's escape pods were capable of linking together, forming large arrays in order to pull resources. Moving away from escape pods and towards podcasts, hold for laughter, 
Let's take a look at the Delta Flyer. Voyager encountered a lot of unique hazards while trapped in the Delta Quadrant and needed to adapt in order to survive. Tom Paris began petitioning Captain Janeway to let him build a new support craft for Voyager as a replacement for their tiny, weak Class II shuttles. Tom, along with Harry, Torres, Tuvok and Seven, designed and built the first version of their new ship the Delta Flyer, in the episode Extreme Risk. It was equipped with state-of-the-art technology to make it as maneuverable, armored, and deadly as possible. Its systems included extendable warp nacelles, advanced hull plating and unimatrix shields, escape pods, and a Borg-inspired weapon system courtesy of Seven. Aside from being one of the most advanced support crafts ever built, the Flyer also had a stylish, retro design added by Tom, a lover of old analog technology. The interior swapped the familiar touchscreen controls of shuttles for physical switches and buttons resembling a modern plane cockpit. The Delta Flyer went on to be beloved by engineering nerds across the Federation, including Sam Rutherford, who saw it as one of the coolest ships ever made. Although most Starfleet vessels were not designed primarily for combat, there were exceptions. Of course the Defiant was created to fight the Borg threat, but Starfleet also produced attack fighters for large-scale conflicts. These fighters were about the size of a runabout, halfway between a shuttle and a typical starship, and issue 68 of Star Trek The Official Starship's Collection listed its maximum speed as an incredibly fast Warp 9, with a crew complement of only two. They were used frequently in battles during the Dominion War, and some were even stolen and upgraded by the Marquis, who used them to fight back against the Cardassians. Attack fighters didn't typically engage hostiles on their own, instead relying on support from a fleet of starships like we saw in the DS9 episode Sacrifice of Angels, which is why we're including them here as auxiliary craft. Now let's look at something a little more niche. In the two-part Voyager episode Future's End, we learn that a Starfleet timeship from the 29th century, the Eon, had crash-landed in 1960s America and accidentally kick-started a revolution in computer technology. Henry Starling found the vessel and reverse-engineered its tech to create Chrono Works Industries. Later, Starling nearly accidentally destroyed the entire solar system with a temporal explosion by trying to use the Eon to travel to the 29th century to steal more tech. Clearly, these small ships can be pretty dangerous in the wrong hands. The Eon was a small one-person model HB-88 timeship used by the Federation's Temporal Integrity Commission in the 29th century. This organization was tasked with policing incursions and anomalies in the timeline. The USS Relativity, a Wales-class vessel, was a futuristic time-traveling starship used by these agents, and the Eon seemed to be a form of support craft for it, or similar larger timeships, though it is possible that the Eon was advanced enough to function autonomously for long periods. Lastly, let's take a look at workbees. Workbees first popped up in the motion picture when they were seen working on the Enterprise at the San Francisco Fleet Yards orbiting Earth. Workbees were designed as maintenance vehicles for a single pilot. They could carry cargo and had a variety of tools that could be used for repairs and upgrades, along with detachable robotic arms for moving components. These small ships were also seen working at the Utopia Planitia Fleet Yards in orbit of Mars, and flying around space stations like Deep Space Nine, carrying out maintenance on dock ships and the station itself. Some extremely similar vehicles called worker bees appeared in Star Trek Discovery aboard both the Shenzhou and Discovery. These were likely an earlier model of the standard work bees we've seen before, but it's unclear whether there were any major differences between the two crafts other than their designs. We also saw that the arms of the worker bees in Discovery could be controlled by high-tech gloves worn by the pilot. And that was every auxiliary craft in Star Trek Explained. If you can think of anything that we may have missed, then let us know down in the comments. Be sure to like and share this video, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And tap the notification bell to be alerted for future videos. Be sure to check out the original article written by our very own Marcus Fry. You can find us on Twitter at Trek Culture and on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. You can find myself on Twitter at Tom C. Finn and on various other socials as well. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, bye bye.